Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. Today we're chatting with Karen Roselle, a repeat guest on the show. We love Karen's approach to business. You might remember if you listened to our previous episode with her that she's a business coach for health and wellness coaches that teaches the art of the happy little practice. Not the multiple six figures practice or the scale to seven figures language that we hear so often, but just like a really comfortable living doing what you love while also having time and energy for your life. And maybe that's five figures. Or heck, maybe it is six or seven figures. The point is, it's happy. It feels balanced. We revisit this conversation now in the context of a world that has changed drastically. A world where many health, fitness, and nutrition coaches are flocking to the online space because the feasibility of an in-person practice has become difficult. It's an opportunity that is once exciting and daunting. And this episode is a pep talk for that. We'd love to have you screenshot your podcast player and tag us on Instagram at Health Coach Radio. And by the way, the show notes for this episode and all previous episodes of Health Coach Radio can be found at primalhealthcoach.com slash radio. Our show is proudly brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute, now an accredited educational provider with the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaches. This means that our graduates can become eligible to sit for the NBHWC credentialing exam to become a board certified health and wellness coach. Check out primalhealthcoach.com slash level two to learn about our new advanced coaching course taught by me that will nudge you out of your comfort zone, launch you into coaching mastery and qualify you to sit for the board certification exam. Laura's gonna share a little more about what we teach and how at the end of today's episode. In the meantime, let's get on with the show. Please enjoy this conversation with Karen Roselle. All right, Karen Roselle, thank you so much for joining us again. So we've had you on this before and we loved you so much. We wanted to have you back. Um, But this time you have some pretty specific ideas that you really kind of want to be able to share with our audience in the aftermath of just the craziness that's happened. But for those who did not hear the first interview where we talked all about you and your business, the happy little practice, I love. So we want to touch on that a little bit too and how it's relevant to what you're talking about. But just for the purpose of folks that haven't heard from you before, can you give us a little refresher on who you are and and kind of why you're here? Well, it's good to be back. Um, We were saying uh, before we started recording that last time we talked, it was in April and it was totally fine. And then the next month things blew up. Mm -hmm. That's right. (laughs) So uh, 20 years coaching. I started as a health coach, probably the first five years and uh, long story short, um, family life created what I call the happy little practice method, which we did a nice uh, episode on. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I wanted to talk with you guys again was things have changed and I've had to really kind of jump in with my clients on those who have a business. Now I'm assuming the the ones who have a business, how do you keep earning in uncertain times, COVID, civil Mm -hmm. unrest, environment, political divisiveness, election, (laughs) just keep adding. I'm sure we can come up with more. How do you keep earning during this time? You know, not collapse. And then for the people that are thinking about starting a business, how do you start? Mm-hmm. Right. right. The temptation is to wait mm-hmm. and ride things out, which there's nothing wrong with that, which I want to preface everything that we're saying. You know, the stuff that I wanted to share, this is the things that I've been talking with my clients and it's coming from also 20 years of coaching and having ridden through mm-hmm. uh, two sessions. Uh, one in 2008 was actually when I actually started doing really well in business. And then there was a shorter one in 2001, actually earlier with around 9-11. And what, you know, we can get right into it. What I've noticed is that when times of crisis, people go back to this back to basics movement. And we can misinterpret that as everybody hunkered down and no one spend money. And there are some people that are doing that. And those aren't your clients, right? Mm -hmm. We are not to market to people who are like in dire straits. That's just unethical. 
I think, Mm -hmm. but not everybody is struggling. And some people, it's like the greatest act of sanity to work with a health coach. But I couldn't begin to even go down this road if I hadn't, you know, just a little caveat. My husband and I, beginning of pandemic, we sat down and like, worst case scenario, what are we doing? Like if nothing works out, like whatever we do and we can't make any money and all our, you know, just all the worst case scenarios, we had a kind of heart to heart conversation where we created a contingency plan, allowed ourselves to face the worst case scenario. How would we ride out two years if we couldn't make any money? Well, Mm -hmm. once we had that heart to heart, we were able to kind of get to work knowing that, okay, we have a plan. We don't like the plan. (laughs) (laughs) I want that to happen. But if it does, we've got something in, in mind, right? So that, you know, to begin the conversation, I'm going to assume that you want to keep earning as a coach or you want to start earning as a coach. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm here today. Yeah. When you said, uh, I'm going to, you know, a lot of coaches who are maybe get trying to get into business right now are thinking, I'm just going to ride this out. I'm going to wait and ride this out. To be honest with you, some real talk to any coaches listening, I feel like that's a really convenient excuse that honestly comes up in, even in times of non-pandemics. I'm just going right. to wait until, I'm going to wait until, I'm going to wait until the when then thing. Um, and this is just another expression of the when then sort of syndrome. I, although this is a legitimate thing that's, you know, happening this, when I'm, we're not making this up. This is a real thing. Um, but to your point, it's like, you can start now. And there are people who are, are desperate for your help now. It, it's not right. really true that everyone's battened down the hatches and is buttoned up their purse strings, not other metaphors of those, those na- that nature. So what's, when, when you are talking to your clients about this and they start sharing this apprehension, um, how do you help them step into courage a little bit? Well, there's very practical actions you can take, but it always helps to get your thoughts and feelings like in alignment first, Mm -hmm. because I've had clients who had, who had just started their business and were going to use their full-time job to fund the next two or three years of getting their business off the ground, lost their job. And so they start scurrying with plate, putting things together to try to cover their income. And to have that conversation, I'm like, I'm not in your situation and to have like, a, am not emotionally attached. And you're like the greatest, the fastest path to you actually being financially stable is your business, not the 15 hour, $15 an hour gig. Right. And when, when you pull yourself out of the first, you have to kind of manage your nervous system. Like before we can get into what you could do and you're, and this is where we as health coaches, like we've got a lot of game in this department of how to manage our nervous system from how we eat, how we move, you know, the coping skills that the average person does not know. Right. And to leverage that in your business. I was just talking on a podcast yesterday and I was telling them like half the time, I feel like I have to treat myself like some sort of professional athlete, even though, Mm -hmm. you know, if you knew me, like to athlete and me don't go together. (laughs) It's not like I'm out there like Laura (laughs) lifting weights and doing all the things, but I have to treat myself in such a way that I can manage my nervous system to send a signal of safety and calm that my brain picks up and says, okay, nothing's, nothing's terribly wrong in this moment. Then I can think clearly. So to leverage all these things that you do with clients for your own well being. And then you can think strategy, then you can think, and then there's also things to learn, like back to basics movement in times of crisis is when people hire coaches more often, because that back to basic movement can be for some people hunkering down, but for other people, they're forced to kind of reckon with what's most important. Like some people are, have a lot more time now. Mm -hmm. They need something productive and positive to focus on. You know, your client market may actually shift. Like a lot of times people hired me who were in the same stage of life with me in their forties, had little kids, Mm -hmm. you know, who's hiring me now are people late forties, fifties, sixties, and their kids are teenagers. And they're like, they, they manage themselves, Mm -hmm. you know, they have, so to be able to one with that nervous system, like checking yourself, understanding that in times of crisis, people double down on like, what, what, what can I control? Right. My health, 
maybe my relationships, what, like, what can I control? It's not just health coaches, like, Hey, all parenting coaches on deck, <laughs> we need you now <laughs> because I'm homeschooling this year and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. You know, um, the exercise you were talking about that you went through with your husband, I went through with my husband before I started my business and before we really made the commitment to make a change. And I just think it is such a valuable exercise to force yourself to sit and face the worst case scenario. And what would you do? Because if you do have sort of that action plan, even though you don't like it, suddenly your worst case scenario isn't so bad, right? But then also we had the conversation of how likely is that worst case scenario really, right? What's probably more likely, which was, a slower, more moderate level of success over time. It was just going to, you know, versus kind of what was our best case scenario. Like we kind of sat and tried to pre-experience what this might feel like and what would we do in any of those scenarios. And and oh, there's always the unforeseen. Absolutely. But what I love about that, and when you speak to the point of kind of managing the central nervous system, I think having that sense of kind of what to expect where the future doesn't seem quite as unknown anymore really helps with that, with managing the anxiety of the situation a little bit. That, and also knowing, okay, people actually want to hire you right now. And to one of the mindset shifts is it, one of the practices, the nervous system management, but one of the mindset shifts is to be able to discern the difference between what you're experiencing. Like I have two little kids who walk in on podcasts when, that I'm doing, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm like, so unprofessional. I can't keep my business going. I can have all this drama about how I think everybody's living. But not everybody is out of time or out of money, you know? And, mm -hmm. and to be able to make sure you don't transfer your own like upsets and worries. Like I have a client who said, you know, I don't really want to follow up too much because I don't want to bother them. I'm like, listen, the landscapes for speaking, if, if we do a signature talk for marketing, like I do and some of my clients do, there are more speaking gigs than ever now. Like it's helpful to know that. And the people that are booking talks regularly or podcasts regularly, they are booking talks, whether there's election going on or COVID or mm -hmm. civil unrest, they are, they are doing it. So that idea that will wait or things will calm down if you need to keep earning we don't wait. We stay in the game and we do it with heart and sensitivity, right? Mm -hmm. Like I remember when I was reaching out for talks and it was just like, we didn't know who won the election. And right. everybody's like, <laughs> you know, and I heard someone say on one of my classes, I'm, I'll do that thing in my marketing after the election. I'm like, no, what? Why? Don't do that. Why? Because you're worried about you're so, maybe that person's really into politics and it's like, I can't mm -hmm. imagine doing anything else. So in my outreach, I might say, we don't know what's happening, but it always feels good to show up for work. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and so I'm going to reach out and you can, you can acknowledge the beast in the room in your marketing, in your outreach and still show up. Mm -hmm. So I just think that coaches are made for this time. We like our clients yeah. need the coping skills that we know, you know, that yeah. we know how to process emotions. We know how to not like stress eat. Yep. Right. <laughs> I, I think, I think, um, our, sometimes our, our, like, you know, the, the example you just gave of the, the client of yours, that was waiting for the election results to come in because perhaps, perhaps that person is just very politically oriented and c couldn't take a step forward until they knew what the outcomes. And I think sometimes our own, I think oftentimes our own narratives, we, we, we sort of apply them to other people. Like I, this is what I'm going through. So everybody's going through the same thing, but it's simply right. not true. It's simply not true. So I think we, I think we have to kind of almost transcend our own, you know, that's to your point of getting your mind, your head and heart kind of right. Like who am I, where am I at? And now potentially the, the rest of the world is not kind of where I'm at right now. Um, well, I was thinking about this. I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, my, my health coaching clients that I have right now are sharing with me that even though this is a very, it's a time of crisis for sure. It's just weird. It's just weird. Mm -hmm. I, I hesitate to use the word crisis because ugh. right. anyway, but it's a weird time. Let's just call it a weird time. And what my clients are struggling with is they have more 
time and space to think and ponder and consider their life. And, and they don't even know what to do with it. Like I've got clients who are like, I've got this like three hours of kind of downtime in the evening after I close my laptop and my work day is done. And now I don't have my commute and my kids aren't playing soccer. And I literally don't know what to do with myself. So I'm opening the wine bottle at 4.30. And to me, it's like, that's an old opportunity. Like, hey, like, so I'm putting this messaging out there in my marketing. Like, yeah. hey, hey, potential clients, are you mm -hmm. finding yourself with a bunch of downtime? I've got some great ideas. Let's work on your personal development. What if you tried this? What if you tried that? What if, hey, what if you hired a coach? you know, just planting the seed uh, for our health coaching clients that in some ways, this weird time is presenting opportunities we've never had before. Right. Well, I, to piggyback on that, if I notice this other trend that happens during times of crisis, or at least particularly now that there is a leadership gap that we in America are feeling mm -hmm. at the federal level in terms, in terms of how they, how the federal government responded to COVID right? Everybody, every state was like, you're on your own, figure it out. Um, but also like in our industry. And I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, it was like, everyone's, we're being safe. And well, it, it's just these, there was no sense of like, here's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And there's no knocking that because people don't know what to do. Right. Um, but and then there's the group, there's even in your niche, there'll be people who just stop marketing and await and look side to side to see what's doing. And if you know, there's so much chaos and kind of lack of leadership that your clients are in this kind of, or potential clients can be in this kind of chaotic vibration, if you will. And you can close that. Your business can be this oasis of, not that you're yeah. trying to solve all the things, but like, hey, you know, how not to turn to over drinking during this time. Mm -hmm. That's an it, important problem to solve. It's, it's, but this leadership gap is so true. I, I just feel like, at least here in the US, so we, it, um, there are so many people in leadership positions that have disappointed us that um, meaning they don't walk the walk, right? They might come out with policies that they require, that they're requiring everybody else, but they don't adhere to them, right? You also don't have a um, cohesive message from the top down and all the policies here in the US from state to state are basically based on what political party your leader is from It's and, and total opposites. Okay, so we have this sort of lack of general leadership, not to mention all the different sources of information about COVID, about safety, about what works, what's true, what's accurate, how much of the scientific information is actually just kind of buried, right? There's a lot of stuff that, um, anyway, long story short, to, there's like, there's like this lack of calm, reasonable leadership going on. And I, just, I think you're so right that this is an opportunity for coaches to step into this role for their clients from the standpoint of, look, there's nothing we can do about all that noise, <laughs> right? But there's a lot that we can do that's going to be, a, I don't know, I guess directly affect you and how you live your life and your family. Let's work within those parameters and being that voice of reason, that voice of calm, showing up and being a leader, but at the same time, encouraging that client to be their own leader mm -hmm. right. and moving forward. Um, you're so right. That's what's missing. And so I guess my question for you is how do coaches do that today? In particular, those that aren't fundamentally feeling it inside yet. Yeah. Right. You how know, do you present that? My secret to showing up when I don't like I think a lot of us coaches are natural caretakers and givers and have this need to help. And I have never made my marketing about like me. Like I don't have a desire to be famous. I don't like, it's not like I was like, yay, I'm going to be a speaker. <laughs> like it was none of that, but it was about like, I have this information. I've got to let everybody know about it. You know, like I've solved this problem. Everybody needs to know about it. And so it's about, I can set aside no matter how chaotic things, sometimes there have been days where I don't know how I'm going to navigate like homeschooling and like Drew and I have the same client calls at the same time. What are we going to do? And it may be challenging to show up, whether it's for my marketing or my client coaching calls. But when I do, it feels so great 
in those moments where I can just show up and serve and help and share information and focus on somebody else's life. Um, I always, I tell this to my clients all the time. I'm like, we're going to get to work. I know that you're freaking out about your things, but to me, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I know how to solve your problems because that's what we're here. We're in this coaching engagement for, I, I don't know how to solve COVID or all the other things that are going on. But mm -hmm. right now I feel really capable and confident because I'm just going to focus on you. Never mind if that my 10 year old's going to walk by in our zoom call, <laughs> <laughs> whatever that I don't know how to solve yet, but it feels really good. That's why I feel like it's a, a really an act of sanity mm -hmm. for people to mm -hmm. hire us, but also for us to show up. And there's this, I think in coaching, particularly health coaching, I think there's a lot of like, we have to look perfect and be perfect. Mm -hmm. And I always tell my clients, if you can show imperfection, you know, show your wrinkles in your pictures, show, you know, tell stories that of you, you know, making mistakes, people are like, oh, okay. I don't have to be perfect to actually get to work. Right. You know, get to start solving this mm -hmm. thing. You know, mm -hmm. if you've been in entrepreneurship for a long time, which is what we, I didn't know I was entering entrepreneurship as a coach. I was just like, I want to coach people. I didn't know I was going to have to be a leader, right? I'm not trying to lead the world. I'm trying to lead my little pod of clients. Mm -hmm. But when I show up for that, it can make me feel like I got this. I mean, I may yeah. hang up the phone and be like, hey, you know, there's other stuff that's a problem. Yeah. But I think that's like the number one, you focus on your clients instead of like how you're feeling at all times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's space and time for that. But if you wait to feel perfect, it's like, you know what it's like? It's like you don't go for exercise unless the weather is just right. Right. <laughs> right. And I live in the Northeast where it's really cold. And I figured out that I was going to get really out of shape every winter if I didn't embrace winter sports, mm -hmm. you know, or I, cause, because the roads are icy. I can't get mm -hmm. anywhere. I can't go to the gym. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had to get over the whole, like, it's a little cold. I can't <laughs> go for a walk. Yeah. And it's a little bit like that. I can't mark it because I don't feel that inspired today. But when you show up with like, I don't feel inspired and I'm going to add value today, mm -hmm. your brain starts to get rewired to like, I can be successful no matter how I feel. I can right. go about it very tenderly. You know? Yeah, or, or reframing what success is. Success is I've given somebody a nugget of wisdom that they were able to implement and now they, they, they think of me as somebody who has solutions to problems. Well, I think it's interesting though, Karen, when you're sharing kind of, you know, your, your sort of feelings about how um, your experience as a coach is, has sort of morphed as we've gone through this, because I think anybody who's listening and any uh, the three of us on this call who have been coaching for a while, I can, I can totally relate to that. It's like, wow, like my coaching relationships do feel different now, even though they're probably not different, but now people like, I used to spend a lot of time. I've always spent a lot of time with my clients as an example on their daily schedule. Like if the big hurdle is I don't have time to make breakfast. It's like, okay, tell me about your Monday. What do you do on Monday? Let's go Monday. You wake up at this time. You got to be at the office this time. Okay. Tell me about Tuesday. And like, I will get granular with my clients calendars. And I'm sure in the olden times, they thought that was very strange for their nutrition coach to <laughs> be dissecting their calendar. But it's like, yo, that's just what I do. Now they want me to do it. They're like, I don't know how to orchestrate my day. Cause I'm at home all the time now, okay. help me orchestrate my day. So I'm like, okay, get out your calendar. What does Monday look like? Let's go. And so it's been interesting as a coach to observe my clients change in this way? Like where maybe, maybe three or four years ago, they like, am I getting a meal plan? Or are you going to tell me my macros? It's like, nope. And now they're like, I don't even really want that. I just need to get my head screwed on straight and my day organized. So anyway, as a practicing coach, it's been interesting to watch clients, like the, the totality of clients, kind of their mindset shift that way. But for new coaches who are coming in to this, um, and don't have the experience of what, what it's been like to, to kind of ride this change, what do you say to those folks? I think you have so much cover for being wildly imperfect right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And no one's, no one's expecting, like, if you have a new idea to like go spend six months with a branding expert, I mean, maybe if you're already making like $300,000 or I don't know, maybe you could do that. But if you've got, you have per, like permission to just be like, Hey, I want to get in here and I want to help. I have some solutions marketing is not about like telling people who you are per se, but it's like telling people I have a solution to a problem. Do you have this right. problem? 
do we have a match? And so if you're new, you already have some training or maybe your own personal experience. You can just no website. You're like, listen, but you know what's going down and I'm getting in the game. Mm-hmm. And I know how to do X, Y, and Z. Do you need help with this right now? Yeah. So you just, tw- you just tweaked something for me that I thought was really important to jump on. So again, in before times, <laughs> um, <laughs> we, would, we would have cl- uh, coaches. AC, before COVID. <laughs> AC, would, after COVID. We would have coaches say, you know, like we'd have coaches who got into this, wrapped up in this paradigm where I'm a health coach, I deliver health. Health is what I do. I do health. It's like, we would, we always, Laura and I are like really beat the drum. We're like, no, you don't, you don't sell health. People don't know that they need health, like get more like granular. But anyway, and a lot of times people will say, my story is not interesting enough. My story is not unique enough. I don't have a really dramatic transformation story. I don't have a health, you know, recovery story, blah, blah, blah. Here's the deal. Every one of us has, is living a story right now. Like every one of us is living this story right now. And like whatever is your struggle hurdle hiccup in navigating these uncertain times right now, go with that. Like I used the example earlier of the, the weird times after in the evening where my clients are popping the cork on the wine bottle a little, little earlier than they normally would be <laughs> yes. and getting that bottle done before bed and not feeling good about themselves. Well, I'm experiencing that lull in energy in activity too. All the things that I used to fill my evenings with are gone. And so I've been navigating myself how to occupy my evenings. I'm, I'm taking online courses. I'm personal developing myself. I'm renovating a room in my house. What the hell? Why not? Mm -hmm. So whatever your lived experience is right now, coaches, other people are living that experience right now. It has nothing to do with your, um, your dramatic health transformation at this point. It's like your lived experience right now. What have you helped yourself manage through these uncertain times and put that messaging out there? Cause people are going through the same thing. If I had like zero experience other than some practice, whatever. And I was aware of this problem. Like, are you new at home? Like, do you, mm-hmm. did you notice this thing too? Or you have like, you want to start drinking at 4 30 because we, all the things are gone. Mm-hmm. you know right. what if we tr- like made this time count you know like like and and do a short program around just solving that problem yeah. right not all the things and they let them have that success where they and there's something in marketing like when you can make something like piece pick take um a chunk of the problem not the whole health transformation but like right. transform their evenings mm-hmm that feels believable, like doable mm-hmm. with some guidance. Maybe you only need 30 days or 60 days or night. You know, it doesn't need to be that intense, but you can sell that. Oh yeah. For and that's a, that's a big issue. I think for a lot of people, I don't know about you, Aaron and Karen, but in my health coaching clients, I hear this all the time. Like I'm fine during the day. I'm busy enough or uh-huh. I'm working or whatever. And I'm on a schedule and during the, so during the day, I'm fine. I eat kind of the same things and these are all, but what, where I get just bogged down or where things get tripped up is at night. And I hear it all the time. I think that would be a phenomenal idea around how to construct your evenings to avoid the landmines. Mm -hmm. You know, what are they? Let's identify them. We need to map a route around them or figure out a way to get rid of them. You know, I love that. It's sort of like the, the fitness professionals that you know, went to market with these online, do it yourself, do it at home, no equipment require, required programs. Like mm-hmm. that, like we can intellectualize that. Like, okay, people's gyms are closed. They don't have equipment because you can't get any. Let's build a body weight training program. But like take that idea and apply to other elements of health, mental health, spiritual health, physical health, nutrition, whatever. Um, sleep, hygiene, you could, you could drill down to something really specific just like the fitness professionals did. Mm-hmm. and create some kind of like at-home online course. Because we talked about this, this came up a sec, uh, earlier in the conversation. What people want right now, or what, what they have the mental energy almost to consider right now is, or they're putting on the front burner as an important topic is this idea of self-efficacy and autonomy. Like, mm-hmm. I, like the health consumer is like, okay, the world's gone to heck in a handbasket. I need to take care of me, but I need to understand how to take care of me. And I, I want to have an inner knowing of how to take care of myself. No matter, like if any, if the b- balloon goes up again and the shit gets weird, I want to intrinsically and intuitively know how to take care of myself. Like, I think there's an appetite for that in the health consumer right now more than anything. Yeah. You know what, I, what I'm hearing, and this is just, these are not people that are my clients. These are my friends and family members that have been terrified for months now to go anywhere or do anything. 
um, at the end of the day, they just don't want to be afraid anymore. Right. They, they, I mean, that's the big deal. I, I, my father has one sibling, my aunt, younger sister, and you know, she's, gosh, she's going to be 70 soon. Her husband's got asthma and they care for her um, mother-in-law who's in her nineties. So they go nowhere. She has not seen her children, my cousins live and in person in months. And she, I just feel like every time I hear from her, she's on the verge of tears. She's terrified, Mm -hmm. you know, and there are a lot of people that are like this. And I I think you're right, Erin. I think the message in a lot of ways is being able to get across to that demographic that it's okay to be fearful. I understand, but I know how to fix it. I know how to help you get some of that courage back. Right. And, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not even sure I'd have to really noodle over that messaging, but that's, I mean, these are all just ideas just to the people listening that the three of us as experienced coaches are thinking through, how can we take this unique period of time, build something of value to our niche or end client that can really make a difference. And, and something I want to ask you to speak to Karen, something you said earlier, I can't remember if you said it while we were recording or before, but it is okay to make money through all this. It is okay to charge people a fair price for solving a problem that has them miserable, frozen, unhealthy, unproductive during this time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, we've been sharing some ideas that just these little nuggets, you know, fixing the evenings, helping clients get out of just the terror, giving clients their autonomy back. We can build programs around all this. How do we help or how do you help coaches feel comfortable with but just marching forward, building a profitable business and making money doing something that they love. I had a client at the beginning of that. Maybe it was beginning or in the middle of COVID. And she says, uh, I went to, uh, she's in an emerging market in Europe where the coaching is new, Okay, like 20 years behind where we are. And she said, I went to a networking group and they, all said it was disgusting to market right now. And anybody who was marketing right now or trying to get clients during this time was really unethical. And she's like, is it? Oh my gosh. And I said, okay, first of all, give me their names and numbers right now. (laughs) (laughs) And That's how I was livid at that. I think we should look at ourselves as a special kind of first responder or Mm. essential worker. You know, because the tool, the things that we help people with are so important and keep people together. And it would be unethical and maybe disgusting, as this woman had said, to go for people who don't have any money and exactly. aren't paying mm-hmm. Go for people. You may have to adjust who you market to, right? You need to go for people who can pay you. Yes. Right. And right. You can write books. And you can do that. Your free stuff in your marketing can be in this time of crisis, people started offering free programs Mm -hmm. and then they like started getting like burned out from that. I'm like, no, keep your free stuff in your, your marketing. Mm -hmm. And yes, you may, you can change what you offer, like take a piece of like your big program and just do like a, you know, a, a 30 day program on getting your evenings under control. I'm making something up, Mm -hmm. but it is okay to sell right now. When you recognize like we were made for this time, we are a a set an essential worker for perhaps not the people in the hospitals on ventilators, not like that, but the people who want to stay out of the hospitals, you know, and feel this autonomy and, and get out of fear and, you know, take charge of their health. And they have the time. There's a lot of conversation Mm -hmm. around supporting small businesses now. Right. People got money that they didn't know, like, oh, what should I do with this money? And make it count, like invest in yourself. Um, But you have to give your clients permission to do that. And you do that by being visible and talking and marketing with sensitivity and heart about what's going on right now. Because otherwise, if you don't show up, it looks like you're out of business or that you're like, it's not okay to hire you. 
um, or, you know, if the way that you talk about it can make it be mm-hmm. like, it's not okay to do that. What I notice for my own clients is they're the only ones in their immediate inner circle that is really investing in themselves. Mm-hmm. Even though they're health professionals, health coaches, they're 80% of my clients are in the health field. Mm-hmm. And uh, in terms of investing in their business and working with somebody, we're going to figure this out. We're in, we're, we're going to work together for at least 90 days, a year. And everyone else they know might do like a $300 like program where they never really, you know, mm-hmm. it's just like light investment. Mm-hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And so they don't ever really like, they still feel alone, even though they're surrounded by other coaches and professionals Mm -hmm. and your practice can be the same thing. Um, I know like over the pandemic, I invested in in mindset courses, just, just not because I needed them, but because I'm like, I, I need to be my best. Mm -hmm. Like during when I work, of course, but like when I'm not working, I have to turn and try to educate my kids and not scar them for life, you know, (laughs) in our first year of homeschooling. So, right. Well, I think, I think you touched on something so interesting and it, it, maybe it's an indelicate conversation, but what the hell, but like money. Okay. That's money. Delicate. Yeah. Like, okay. So first of all, this has never changed. If a client can't afford you, they're not your client. If they can't afford your program, that's fine. Like detach from the outcome. They're not your client. They really never have been. So that hasn't changed. Like if somebody says, oh, I can't afford that right now. It's like, well, great. Well, I'll be here whenever you, if you think you can, or, you know, get that. We guess we've got that before. We'll get that again. But actually, so people have lost their, people have lost their jobs. Businesses have closed. I want to be really sensitive to that. There are a lot of people who financially are struggling through this time. Absolutely. And they're probably not your client for your higher ticket paid program. All good. That's where inexpensive programs or free programs are really amazing. What I was going to say though, is that some people have more money right now. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, I'm not going on my $5,000 Belize vacation this winter. Hmm. You know, and I, I know that sounds like super privileged to say, 100%, I know that sounds privileged to say, but there are people who right. have the resources, time, first of all, the, the resource of time, which is a novelty at this point, like we've talked about that a million times already in this conversation, they have this novel resource of time and they're like, you know, come to think of it, I'm not really spending my money on like three Starbucks runs a day because I'm not even going to the office. So I do have a little bit of extra cash lying around, like people aren't some people are definitely struggling, want to be sensitive to that, but right. not everybody is. And some people are doing better and possibly your target client is, has a little bit of money lying around and for sure has time lying around mm-hmm. if you got in front of them. You know what? And chances are those that are struggling now are probably the people that weren't your target market to begin with, not for a higher end, higher priced ticket coaching, right? So, and you're absolutely right. Where these people are not spending money on vacations and other things right now, they're, I mean, I don't know about you, but it's taken forever to get our pool put in because everyone and their money mother is sinking money into their house because they're not spending it on something else. Why wouldn't a message about using that money and investing in themselves from a health perspective make just as much sense, if not more, right? And then to kind of tackle this, one of the things that, you know, through the COVID pandemic, as far as being able to be a service for those who can't afford that, that's what my free Facebook group was all about. You know, one of the things I'm looking to establish here is like a free walking group for the women in my subdivision. Yeah. You know, have a walk with coach Laura and just ask some questions. Um, and it will just be free. And it's just a great way to share knowledge and get to know the people around me and provide something of value. And it's free marketing. It's free. You know, I, I did the same, same thing. Like I, um, started a, a group and it started hosting like every six weeks, a, a coaching call, like show up and hmm. I will, help. I'm ready to pitch in. And then I still have the same amount of clients that, you know, that the, of course that helps the, the, the people that are thinking about really hiring me. And it also calms my mind. Like I'm pitching in, I'm helping people who I know will never hire me. 80% of my list will never hire me Mm -hmm. like that in marketing. You can have thousands and thousands, but really you're looking at 20% of your list that are maybe looking. And so I already made peace with like the majority of the time people are not going to, that I come in contact, don't hire me, but I don't need them to. I have a small business clients amount month. So 
it's okay, but to make sure that you're not giving like 80% of your time to the free stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have um, a, fr a good friend, like a lot of my friends are in the fitness industry as well, because I've been in the fitness industry for a long time too. And one of my friends went on this rant. I'd love to know your thoughts on this. She said, guys, quit offering free programs because some of us are offering paid programs and you're, you're ruining it for us. <laughs> what do you hmm. think about that? No, whatever anybody else does is never going to ruin what I do, you know? Um, so I don't, I would never think that I would just, when something, th there's a rule of thumb that we have in our household. Cause we're a two coach household. <laughs> when there's something we don't like, we use it as a way to pivot or to use that to cl further clarify what it is I will do and what I won't do anymore. Mm -hmm. So if there's tons of free programs, I don't know about you. Like, I don't like when I want to solve something, I'm not look necessarily looking for the free thing. Me neither. Right. I don't have time. I don't want the, to like sift through all the stuff. I'm like, I don't even want to coach with other people's coaches. I'm like, give me the source, <laughs> right. you know? And there's time and place where I might want something free, but I'm not at the buying phase. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. That's yeah. That's, that's the stage of the change thing. Like, oh, this free thing. Sure. I'll sign up for this free thing. I'll sign up for that. And like, we, t we talk about this a lot about like people need to have skin in the game. And we've often, you know, you've heard, you've heard, I'm sure. And you, maybe you've even shared that Karen, I don't know, but like, we'd say, you know, it's, it's good to charge your worth because people need to, people need to have skin in the game. But, but I'm talking about like the, um, mental skin, <laughs> like, Oh, free thing. Sure. I'll just pop my email address in for that. I'm never, ever, ever engaged with it. I didn't make a buying decision. I wasn't really, I wasn't really looking for that. It just kind of showed up and it was free and might as well. But like when you make a conscious decision to seek out, you know, engage with, invest in something, never mind the financial investment you made, but you've now made a mental and like spiritual investment in it. So it actually has, it's got more sticking power or something, or I'm, you know, people are more invested when they have made a decision to. I found like more options is not better. Like mm -hmm. people are like, and they're like zoomed out all the time. Mm -hmm. Like their way of connecting is through this kind of medium and it's exhausting if you're on Zoom all day long. I, you know, there is, it's wonderful that we have so many options, many of them free or people who have really big businesses can offer something at a really low cost. But it's, it's, people actually don't function best that way. They need like a smaller, like, want to solve this thing in your business here or the options. And I know for me, like, I don't I even like going into like a big store anymore because it's like, ah, over, there's like 5,000 of this one thing that I'm trying to decide on. Whereas if I go online to a favorite retailer, I can just, it's less stimulation, less mm -hmm. overwhelm. And I know for myself, like one of the things that helps me evolve this, well, like what everybody else is doing, I find my clients and I see this for my clients as well. They like to buy the same way that I like to buy, or they like to be sold to in the same way that yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. and so when other people are doing other things, I know my clients, it's kind of like, they don't really care about all the free stuff. Like yeah. it's overwhelming to them. It's just a flood of information. And me That's too. point. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. I, I love that as, I love that as like general marketing advice. Like how do you like to be marketed and sold to do that? Because there's a, there's a whole community of clients out there just like you that like being marketed to and sold to, you know, to, to purchase things, to invest in things the same way that you do. I think it's really just like good marketing advice. Yes, absolutely. Look, I mean, there's, there's a place for, you know, things for free, but you, you really, it's gotta be viewed as a way to market what the real, where the real value is, right. And kind of what you're paid for. And, and, oh, by the way, if that free opt-in or free thing that you offer also provides value for somebody who ordinarily could not afford your services anyway, awesome. Right. Um, and I, there's a, a lot to be said for that, but, um, you know, Aaron, like you, I just, I don't really like being emailed to all the time, you know? Um, but there are certain this is where the whole value thing comes in. There are certain people, certain newsletters that I accidentally signed up for that I just delete the minute I'm like, how did I get on that list? And then there's others that I hang on to because I either know I'll probably be a buyer at some point. I'm just not there yet. 
you know, and I want to stay connected or their emails have value to me. There's something in them that I find valuable or I enjoy or what have you. So um, all the more reason to kind of continue to take action right now, you know, the whole like it, you know, when then scenario is making the assumption that um, nobody's out there looking. And what we're saying on this podcast is that is categorically untrue. We are a lot of people out looking and I would argue probably more that yeah. really want some help and are looking right now. Well, Absolutely. even like when you started the conversation here and you said like, when we talked last time, it was April and things were normal or whatever. And now, but now like we're in a new normal because now it's been like almost a year of this. And so people are kind of like, okay, this is sticking around for a while. Do you find that, do you find that that's a factor? Oh yeah. I find I, somebody that I just started working with, she was like, oh, I was waiting for things to go back to normal. And I've now I've been waiting eight, nine months. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. Or I had a client say, when I can go back to in-person talks is when I'll do that. I'm like, you can't do that. Not mm -hmm. if you can, I've had clients who shut down their business because other things were much more important to them right. during this time. You have to really like the reason that you're making that decision from. Mm -hmm. And when somebody tells me I'm going to wait till in-person talks, I'm like, I would bet on the next two years that you're going to need to be ready to do things virtually, you know, or when my clients you know, our signature method that I teach is giving a signature talk and you use a lot of different formats. You can host your own, whatever. And when, all, oh my gosh, all my talks are getting canceled in March, you know, well, that's not a problem. We can, with very little technology, get up and going virtually. Mm -hmm. So, and now even the places that I would never have thought to approach, for example, the nearby library, it's pretty happening. But everybody who visits that library, um, you know, in a rural Vermont town, like a lot of people are second homeowners yeah. who, you know, like there's this whole other, um, and it connects to anybody who ever even visits this town signs up. So I'm willing to give a presentation there because I'm not trying to market to the local people who are worried about, but to the people who are like, hey, you've got a second home or you're, you've lost your job and you need to make a new job you know, or you need to learn how to go virtually. There are some, one of the things about this is like, if you can slow down enough to kind of breathe and take a little space, even if you have to get up really early, like I do in order to have that, you can see, you know, where there are other opportunities. Like I placed my first print ad in 20 years, mm. you know, because I already know, like if I can give my signature presentation, some really good things come from that. So that ad wasn't just like my email address. It was like, come watch this training, you know, <laughs> come see this thing if it's a, it makes sense for you, you know, because I already have that re training recorded or I could have it live and just do it once a month. You know, I could do it that way. Um, so you bought a print ad because you realize there's an opportunity to market more locally. Yeah. Than, than yeah, I would never, I'd never, I had no, I had a few local clients over the years since I've been where I live in rural, you know, very close to Vermont. Um, but you might have read of this, that there's a lot of fleeing from the cities. Yeah. City life, you know, when you can't go out, it's like, what do you do? Yeah. So people are renting, buying homes, like amazing amount of people moved into my neck of the woods, which mm -hmm. I find great because I'm also somebody that left the city and I'm like these are my people <laughs> welcome <laughs> do you have a coaching business question <laughs> that's so you interesting know? it's so interesting you say that because I I live also rurally and I also I live kind of on the way to the mountains so recreational sort of hiking and you can still do that you're allowed to go hiking that's one of the only things you're allowed to do is go outside and recreate um, and I was dr myself driving out to the mountains one day and there's this billboard and this billboard would be visible from people in my community who are, you know, driving around, but also people who are commuting to the mountains to recreate. And I toyed with the idea of buying a billboard. Like, I, like it's so funny that you said you got you, you had your first print ad in 20 years. I was like, I'm going to go traditional, get a freaking billboard on the highway on the way to the mountains, because that's where people are. 
And isn't that wild? Because like I worked in advertising for, for 20 years and I moved away from the traditional like, oh, forget print, TV, radio, now billboards, now just go online, social, you know. And now it's like this complete kind of backwards renaissance. Like hmm, people are kind of simplifying a little bit, reading the paper and driving to the mountains, you know. Isn't that well, wild? if you have much more traffic in places like where you live and where I live, that was before. And they're all, when you move to a new area, aren't you like eyes peeled for like, what's here? Like who, what's happening? And you can't go anywhere besides maybe go outside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and is it a risk to buy that billboard or to pay for my ad? It wasn't cheap. And I'm like, what's the worst case? I lost some money mm -hmm. and I learned. And okay, so you don't do that when you're like, I won't be able to feed my kids if I do that and it doesn't work. Okay. Yeah. But I already had traction on the thing that I was putting in the advertising, you know, so you can take the opportunities have expanded and you can still be virtual and online. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Now the library talk can be a talk that's shared across the interlibrary system yeah. of your whole region, you know? So just an example of, if you can see with new eyes, you know, with fresh eyes, first by taking care of your nervous system, <laughs> right? And having some, pra you know, an intention, like, you know, very practically speaking, I used to always have a year long goal. And since COVID, I'm like 30 days. Mm, yeah. Because my brain's like, you can't think of, you don't know what's going to happen in 60 days. Right. And I'm like, right brain. So I'm just going to do the 30 day thing. And I'm like, what I need to do by the end of 30 days. And it gives me a sense of purpose of how I need to show up. Right. And, or try new things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that what you're recommending with your clients now is kind of reframing how they're thinking through their growth and where they want to go and how to, I guess, just try to help get people unstuck out of the mud, you know, um, people that have sort of stagnated because they were fearful or don't know what to expect. And, oh my gosh, things are different. And I don't know what that means. Um, you know, the greatest antidote for stagnation is action. But yeah. if, you know, but looking too far in the future seems to be confounding people. So is, is that the answer then is setting some shorter term goals? Really short term, like that to me works and it works for my clients. Like, yeah, we, I know what I want to be hitting my numbers wise for my quarter, but I feel that that these days that feels like my brain is like, no, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And whether that's true or not, we could work on that. It just feels doable to just be like, all right, by the December 31st, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I've got two weeks to get there right. <laughs> or however my, you know, whatever yeah. the, the amount of time is. And then that there's this, I learned it some, from some mentor It was think less, test more. And hmm. I noticed that when I'm in an action, I tend to really identify with my circumstances like this is and and between your circumstances and how you feel about your business your mood are your thoughts mm -hmm. and our thoughts really drive our feelings and if we can develop uh, a, a practice like for me journaling every morning and be like all right what am I worried about today get it out and then I can look at it and be like okay it's on paper now like that thought is making me feel really anxious if I summarize it. Is there a thought that's a little bit up the, like one rung up the emotional ladder? Mm -hmm. If we think of emotions as fuel for our business, because our emotions mm -hmm. will drive our actions. You know, if we think about our thoughts, feelings, and, and actions, they're very intimately tied. So instead of, so I, I, I make it a very significant part of my marketing. Like it just takes 15 minutes. And sometimes I might give myself an hour to just, get it out what I'm worried about and then be willing to play around with the thoughts and feelings until I have something that's a little bit more in the middle rather than I'm all in or I'm all out. Mm -hmm. It's very exhausting in the all in and all out approach mm -hmm. to your marketing or your business. It's very dramatic. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I work with my clients on is like just making this just what you do mm -hmm. and almost boring. And people are, you know, we're, we're kind of addicted to inspiration as health coaches. Mm -hmm. you know, fresh ideas. And I'm like, yeah, but inspiration is such a fickle friend. Like it comes and goes. And so does your confidence. Like somebody could like breathe on me wrong one day and I'm like, oh no, the business is over, you know? Mm -hmm. But if I kind of choose 
capable. I'm going to, what would I need to think in order to feel capable about what I need to do today? Right. And it gives me many more resources to fuel my actions and like taking action, even if it's imperfect. Like, for example, I teach my clients the practice of the golden hour. We need an hour a day to get our marketing done because we're not doing six marketing things. We're usually doing one thing and one keep in touch marketing. Mm-hmm. But that hour is non-negotiable, but it is flexible. So sometimes it's like five minutes because that's just the kind of day I had. Mm-hmm. You know, my kids were melting down or I didn't have it in me, but I touched it and I paid attention to it. And some days it's a full hour. Yep. And to know that I'm at showing up for it, it will give you such peace of mind, this thing that you're talking about, like just taking action, even if you're not quite sure. And remember, like we have so much cover right now to be wildly imperfect because mm-hmm. everybody's got things going on in their background. Not everybody, but right. We've all seen that CNN video with the guy and then his, like kids come in. Yeah. Yeah. Wife, like had just gone to the bathroom and she like her pants are practically down and she was dragging the kids out. And I'm like, <sighs> That makes me feel so much better. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like what you what, what I interpreted by what you just kind of said is like it's like permission to to oscillate or or be anywhere on the spectrum between stroke of inspiration and just doing the work, right? Like on one hand, it's like yes, have your inspiring moments. On the other hand, sometimes you're just going to show up to work. Like this is my job. This is what I do. And I was thinking about this because, uh, by the way, I also love that your golden hour of marketing. I wrote that down again. Cause last mm-hmm. time we interviewed you and you said that I was like, that is such a good idea. I need to start doing that. Um, <laughs> but I was thinking about this because uh, and it's imperfect action. So I, I recently hired a business coach and in, in doing that, I had to apply and in uh, the application I had to, I had to really I had to really like daydream about what I wanted my whole business to look like, like long, long, long term, which honestly I hadn't done before. And that day, that was a day where I was very inspired. And so I wrote and I wrote and had all these amazing visions that I'd never even conceived before because it was just an, it was an inspirational day for me. And, um, but there's other days where none of that feels realistic. There's some days where I show up and it's like, okay, I'm going to do an Instagram post. I'm going to email my list. I'm just going to get the work done because I have to, this is my job. It's my job. I have to do the work. And there's other days where it's like, wow, I've got like a vision board and I've got, but it's not always that. And I think that this imperfect action is really important pep talk because I feel like entrepreneurs in any category think like if I'm not always showing up as an, as an inspired creature every day, then I'm failing. And that's simply not true. Like some days you're just going to show up and do work. And that's important to do because this is, this is your job, right? That's how I interpreted that. In a business where there's no one else to be accountable for, Mm -hmm. and there's no one to tell you how much is enough that you've done. Right. It's so great. Like I have to check it off. I have to write like, I showed up for my marketing today and I check, check it off. My brain's like, yay. Even though, (laughs) even if no one else really sees it, but me, Mm -hmm. even though that marketing activity might pay off in 90 days or six months from now, right? Like I booked like 10 talks almost in the last 60 days. They're not for next year, you know? And so like, no one sees it, but me doesn't look like a win, but I'm like, you know, there's something about like at the end of the day saying I showed up, even though no one else saw it, it gives, it allows you to enjoy your evening, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. go to sleep soundly. Like I showed up, the compound effect of this will be pretty darn powerful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, 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 on, um, on cyber Monday, I got in, I got inspired. This is another, it speaks again to like market the way you've been marketed to, because as much as I don't like aggressive email marketing tactics, I bought stuff. I bought stuff on Black Friday and Cyber Monday. I sure did because some somebody marketed to me the right way. So I decided I'm going to put a Cyber Monday deal out. And I it was it was actually Monday morning, and I was like, I'm going to do a Cyber Monday deal. I'm going to do it right now. And I just did it. I discounted one of my programs a little bit. I emailed my list, and there was typos in my email. And I'm sure people were already sick and tired of getting Cyber Monday emails because I was like the millionth one they got. But guess what? I sold 25. Which, oh, nice. What do you, which, what it was that as 25 more sales than I was going to get that day for sure. I wasn't going to get any sales that day, but I just imperfectly went out there and said, mm, I'll just pop this out into the, out into the, uh, world and see what happens and got 25 sales. I wouldn't have gotten otherwise, but I was okay, I was okay that day with being imperfect, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always like to, 
every now and then I'll put at the end of my email, I'm like, listen, if you see a typo, it's like my free gift. <laughs> I gotta go. I got kids yelling at me right now. Like you can have fun with this time that we're in and be a little bit of a joy to receive an, an email from. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, absolutely. You know, this is what's going on for me today. And here's what I know for sure, right? You can offer something. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, I want to tap into this signature talk because we talked about it last time too. And, you know, as the admissions director for our school, I hear from people all the time that are just completely overwhelmed and um, scared to death of trying to market on social media. Like, don't know how to do that. I don't even really like Facebook. Is Do I, you know, let me talk about, um, you know, using social media in a way that feels relevant to you. I don't know, maybe to market your talk, but um, I'm a big believer in talks as well. Um, I just think that uh, it's a great way for people to actually get to know and hear directly from you. Um, And my experience has been, if you are the featured speaker someplace, if, if the end goal of all of your marketing is to put you in a position of content expert, oh, I got a question or I've got a problem about something, you need to go see Laura because that's what you are. You need to go see Karen. And I just think it's such a useful tool. Uh, so I love that. Um, how are you navigating that? Is most of that now being done virtually or are there certain circumstances? Are you going to a potential place to speak or an organization with a game plan in mind? Here's the way we do this safely. And, you know, we could do this signature talk. Can you speak to that a little bit about how you're still able to do a signature talk where people can hear directly from you under these conditions? I, you know, for my clients who are in startup or in the first five years, I'm a big fan of them going local, Okay. but they, so, and I shared earlier, like their talks were getting canceled. Mm-hmm. And for me, I had already been doing, it was probably 10 years ago when I remember going to a nutrition school and speaking, I'm like, why am I here? Like this talk I could just done over the phone or whatever it is. So I had already pivoted to like only doing virtual talks unless even all the places that I was going to speak at coaching pools, they weren't bringing me in live anymore. No one. So that had already pivoted for me. So it wasn't a big deal, but for everyone else who were new to this concept, you know, uh, you don't even have to do a PowerPoint or a fancy thing and you don't have to be creating like five talks. You know, your job is to get one talk to work really well. And um, you, you can use Zoom most of the time the places have a a medium that they, you just show up for. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they expect you to have your own medium. Fine. That means that's even better because then you have people opt in Mm -hmm. (laughs) and you got the email addresses to keep the relationship going, or it can be very informal or for some coaching schools, I've done a Facebook live in their group, you know, don't love that as much, but, or now there's all these podcasts or even all the local places now they realize if they haven't already, they had to pivot and go online. Mm-hmm. So you could even ignore online and go to all the local places in your region, but with a signature talk that's virtual. And it can be as simple as you talking, right? You don't need any slides unless you really want some. Yeah. No, I, I just, again, selfishly, me being new down here, I've got to meet more local people now. Um, I'm in Florida, thank goodness. And things aren't as locked down here, you know? So I I do think I would be able to do some in-person talks. It's just, um, you know, reaching out to the right people. I've got to redefine, everything is new now. So I'm still in this kind of rebuild process um, with my business, but, you know, I'm rebuilding this business after having done it for eight years. So it's totally different from the position I was in when I first started. Right. Um, but when I first started, I was comfortable speaking in public because I did that professionally in another career. So here's, here's another question for you um, around that. For folks that don't have that kind of experience that might be afraid of speaking in public, how do you help them get over that? I think it comes back to, again, I, I was never, there are people, I have colleagues who like who would just say, listen, I never got enough attention as a child and I'm happy to be speaking, you know, and it's, it's a wonderful way for me to really feel like healed in that way. And I, I'm all about, can I serve the audience? What, and I like to make signature talks, signature talks about solving a problem. 
Mm -hmm. So it's all about them. And then I'll tell them about me because as it relates to like, to make sure that they don't think I'm some sort of sage on the stage or like, you know, that I've got it all figured out. So if your talk is about solving this problem for this type of person, it's all about them. Mm -hmm. And then you share what you know, right? But there's a structure for that where you, I certainly gave, when I started, I gave talks only in the way that I shared so much information that they didn't ever hire me. That was going to be my question. Like, yeah. how, how do you, do you, what's the threshold there typically? Yeah. Well, I will say that um, there's a methodology that I created around that. Yeah. Um, you can go to greatlittletalks.com and get that. But in short, a lot of times with the talks that I create with my clients, it's half mindset and half practical stuff because we want to build the talk with the end of mind where the, the, the decision point is, do I want to have a first appointment with this person? Because the point of the talk isn't just to feel good and have friends and be on the stage or be in front of people. It's getting clients. Right. And so how do we sell in coaching? We have conversations unless you're selling a group program where you don't need a conversation. So that's, what do we need to teach in order to, at the end, they, the inevitable conclusion is I must talk with Karen or I must talk with Aaron. And so I look at what have your clients, like how do they think that made them want to hire you? Mm -hmm. And so there's usually like some preamble or where you're like, this is the mindset you need to, to, in order to solve this problem. And then you start to solve a little bit. Let's say you do five things with your clients, like nutrition and sleep and movement then you do maybe one or two things and show them that it's a piece of the problem. You like the solution, but it's not everything because you have an hour. Mm -hmm. You don't have like 60 days or 90 days to work with them. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm just Googling something quickly because um, I'm not gonna get it up in time, but okay. So I have this story of, of uh, I, went to, uh, I went to a talk and the talk, this guy, um, he was, he was selling business coaching. Ultimately he wanted to, he, he invited people to this talk who wanted to grow, who were entrepreneurs who wanted to grow their business. And he started the talk by telling this story, um, this very long story that really like sucked me in. I was like, Oh my God, how's the story end? And the story of course ends with him pivoting his business and being very successful. And now I'm here and you can work with me for just this low, low price. And I, threw my credit card at this guy. <laughs> and the very first thing he taught us was how to do that. He's like, remember when you guys sat in that talk that I gave and I totally wrapped you in, he called it like the hero's journey story where you, there's, yeah. and there's a whole formula of like, you start with the backstory, you go through the struggles, you, then there's like an emerging out of the ashes and then there's the triumph. And he said, I'm going to teach you guys how to do that. Cause that's what got you here. And it was like, dang it. That did work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everything that you want to share, share it in a story. Because, right, you and I may geek out on some sort of nutrition info and be like, yeah, did you hear about that thing? And, you know, but most people don't care about, like you were saying before, people don't really care about wellness like we do. They care about, like, I can't get to sleep or mm -hmm. I'm super anxious every night or I don't know what to do with my evenings. And so I drink, you know, or eat cookies. Right, right. Yeah, I just found it. It's called the hero's journey. There's 12 steps. Do you know this, Karen? Yes, sure? yes. It's great. It's very cool. Like, if, like, I mean, we're not going to give away the secrets here, but this is what this guy did. He said he started with the ordinary world. He went to the call to adventure, then the refusal of the call, this whole, whole, whole structure. And yes. it was really cool because like, you know, I always do the math on this. I was one of 30 people that signed up for this guy's program. And it was $13,000. Like I was like, that guy just made bank by telling a good story. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's if you remember that takeaway for your talks, that it is about a story. Like for mm -hmm. me, it was like, I needed to get people like in my happy little practice signature talk. It's very much about like, I need to get people on board with this methodology and this philosophy before I get into like how to do it. You know, and it oh, yeah. is a make or break story. It's either really cute to you or it's like, finally, yeah. you know, and that's what we need to do, whether you're talking about, you know, sugar or whatever you're talking about. I love that you just dropped sugar. I love that you just mentioned sugar because I feel like I've, I've heard a lot of people say, I'm going to go to the grocery store and do a talk on sugar. I'm going to go to the grocery store and do a talk on gut health. It's like, all right. 
<laughs> Why? Yeah. I don't... Right. No, you're right. I mean, we, I mean, we, we've talked about this before about how new coaches, early coaches do have a tendency when they first start out to feel as though they've got to just unleash this boatload of information and, um, and, and talk about inflammation and throw around these big health related words um, because they're teaching. They're like in teacher mode, right? But most people don't really learn that way. Um, not until you get to the point where you're geeky about stuff like we are, right? Most people, when you're just trying, when they're trying to learn about how things actually affect their daily life, they learn much better through stories because they help try to take what's unfamiliar, a concept that's unfamiliar, and try to make it familiar by embedding it inside of a story that people can relate to. Right. Um, back when I was in finance, we had a talk that we used to give. It was a training talk for financial advisors and it was called story selling by taking an unfamiliar concept and making it familiar by wrapping it into a story that other people could relate to. And it's so powerful. Um, and you could use that concept across all aspects of your business, whether it's a marketing story and having the aha moment go off, oh my gosh, I need to talk to her or you know what, she gets it, I need to go talk to her. It's a great way to, I think it help instill inspiration for our clients. It's, it, you know, as far as help, helping them connect the dots to make the decision to take an action, right? right. Uh, we can use it as a way to, from an educational point of view, rather than just having a conversation around blood sugar and insulin, right? Uh, if you can wrap this in a story about how this mechanism actually affects them during the day, the aha moment goes off. Um, and I just think how impactful this can be from the standpoint of bringing in new clients, but then just also building, having more confidence in yourself and your own ability to help people affect change by using that medium. It's, it's a learning curve to understand, like, I you can't run around with gut health unless you tie it to something else. Um, my One of my clients, she came to me with that, so much education in gut health. And um, by figuring out who she was connected to and who she liked working with, we realized she works with expat executives on their personal performance. She uses gut health to get them there. Mm -hmm. That's the tool. Mm -hmm. yeah. But she tells the story of like, you're at this stage of life, right? Exactly. And I know how like her husband's that person too. Like she has this story mm -hmm. that they like, of all the people that are, you know, offering gut health stuff, she's the one that speaks the language of an executive who's an expat living in the Middle East or Asia. Right. Plus right? also that expat doesn't identify as a person with gut health issues. They identify as an expat executive. Right. Right. And there's symptoms that they have that, you know, we can say it's all related. Yeah. Like, right. Isn't everything gut health at this point? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, whatever hey, I mean, got, it's gut health. Oh my gosh. I, I used to tell the story about um, basically lost mental time in the late afternoon. You know, my blood sugar was so wacky that half the time I couldn't remember my afternoons. I, I remember being in the car, driving home from a, you know, like, you know, whatever I'd finish all my client appointments and I'd be driving home at say three o'clock in the afternoon. And there are days I don't remember getting home. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the drive, uh, I, this brain fog and this lack of energy. And just my brain was just so focused on, I guess the mechanism of getting me home, like nothing. I just, it's all one big blur. And I, I remember thinking through, God, what is my problem? I, I'm just kind of getting through every day, but the afternoons are the worst that so many other women in particular were like, oh my God, I totally know what you mean, yeah. you know? And now I understand the mechanism when I can track what I was eating, all that, that was a, these were low blood sugar moments. Right. Um, and, but so that's the mechanism, but I can't go out and talk about low blood sugar and how yeah, that I works. I have it. to talk about What's that? As a, as a new health coach, I went around and tried to create clients with what we called the sugar blues talk mm -hmm. that our school gave us. Yeah. Like, I, I think I have the same talk. Yeah. And guess what? Kind of works sometimes, but most of the time <laughs> it was depressing. Yeah. They don't know that they don't know it's the sugar blues. They just know that they're checked out of life and unable to focus on their afternoon status meetings. Like right. you got to speak to the lived experience again. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So, um, you know, all of this kind of wraps up into that there's absolutely nothing about what's going on today, even though it feels extremely different, that isn't true, even if we aren't within the COVID pandemic, right? People are still completely bewildered about health in general or kind of what, what these symptoms really mean. Um, I still think outside of the conditions that we're in, we've really lacked a lot of leadership, particularly in the health space, um, as far as folks that are deeply rooted in helping clients, helping people feel empowered to make their own choices. Um, I think a lot of this stuff that we're talking about that's happening now was true before we ever got here. It's just more vivid now. <laughs> it feels more extreme now. And all the more reason for coaches to find that courage to step into this now, because I don't think we're going to see another opportunity this obvious in a long time once this passes. Yeah. People need and want you right now. And so you have to override and you have to work with yourself to kind of get, you know, you may be the only one in your household or in your inner circle that's daring to create something or market something or, or start something from scratch when everyone might around you might your immediate family might be like, you know, hunker down and don't spend any money or don't do X, Y, and Z. But this is where more than anything health coaches need. Any coach really needs courage. Mm -hmm. and courage the true definition is you are scared mm -hmm. you are uncertain but you show up anyways and knowing how to dance with that if you can learn that and you only learn that through doing right and then you'll be able to stay in the game as long as you want mm -hmm. as long as you want yeah nice. love it yeah cool all right so Tell us a little bit more about where people can just spend more time with you or around you or hearing from you, because I, I just think the messages that you shared today needed to be heard by a lot of people. Um, and they'll listen to this podcast and they'll be re-inspired. How can they help stay inspired? Well, you can go to KarenRoselle.com. There you go. Yes, I have a website. And then Karen is spelt differently. It's you spell it differently. Yeah. And um, I will judge you if you write me with an E. Just <laughs> <laughs> if you click on start, there are a bunch of free things that you can look at. Even I have a free community that is not on your typical social media. I don't do social media that much anymore. Mm. Um, that's another story. Um, mm. And a free class. And I do free classes now because of COVID. Thanks. You're welcome to join. Wonderful. Yeah, I love it. This is great. It was great reconnecting with you. And thanks for um, giving us the real talk about these uncertain times and how they're just, they're just now the times. That's just, mm -hmm. it's just the times now. It's, it's, there's, of course, there's still uncertainty, but there's always been uncertainty. And so let's just like, you know, let's, let's just kind of quit with the when then game and just act now. There's no reason not to. Yes. Remember that. that. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. This was awesome, as always. Well, thank you. That was fun. Love talking Absolutely. with you guys. Bye. Bye. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening. Well, if you've been listening at Health Coach Radio, you'll know that we're all about raising the voices of practicing health, fitness, and nutrition coaches, but most importantly, helping to further legitimize this exploding industry. Erin and I have disclosed often that we're on the faculty of the Primal Health Coach Institute, founded by none other than the health and wellness legend Mark Sisson. And we've interviewed dozens of guests from just about every different health coaching program you can think of and who practice in just about any conceivable way you can think of. But our allegiance is to the health coaching industry in its totality, first and foremost. 
It's our desire to continuously and unapologetically lift and promote this industry that nudged us to create this podcast for you in the first place. It's this same yearning that encouraged us to take the educational offering at our health coaching school to the next level. We are so proud to offer the Primal Health Coach Level 2 certification course, which when combined with our primary course, the Primal Health Coach certification course, not only satisfies the educational requirements to sit for the board exam, but is specifically designed to teach advanced coaching mastery. You will work closely with a small class of peers through this 12-week, very intensive, live online classroom experience to learn how to execute a coaching relationship that is truly transformational. You'll learn and practice how to ask powerful questions, what it means to hold space for your clients, but most importantly, how to actually do it. You'll learn about the craft of motivational interviewing and the nuances of habit change goal setting, and accountability, and how to nurture your client's own inner knowing, their intuition, and their own self-efficacy so that they will graduate from your care a truly transformed person. You want a big, successful, powerful coaching practice. And maybe you're devouring our episodes looking for the silver bullet that's going to launch your business into the upper echelons. We've said it a million times and we'll say it again. Your coaching skills are what will make or break you and set you apart for success in this field. So if you're looking to level up your coaching skills and maybe dial up your credential and become a board eligible health coach, look no further. You can learn more about PHCI's level two program at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash level two. But if you would value talking to a real person about your path to being a masterful coach and perhaps a board certified coach, Book some time with me personally. You can access my calendar at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or just call me. You can reach me at 844-307-7662. Thank you for listening to Health Coach Radio, and I hope I get to talk to you soon.